Yeah, thank you very much. And um, well, thank you, Johannes, again for joining us today um, from Vienna. And uh, well, here are some um, short and brief um, biographical information on our guest. Um, Johannes Preiser Capella is a team leader of the research group Byzantium and Beyond and of the research area complexities and networks at the Department of Byzantine Research of the Institute for Medieval Research at the Austrian Academy of Science. He also teaches Byzantine and global history at the University of Vienna. And his research interests include historical complexity and network research, as well as the global environmental and migration history of the Middle Ages. His most recent monographs on climate pandemics and the transformation of uh, the old world in two volumes was published in spring 2021. He is also co-editor of the volume Migration Histories of the Medieval Afro-Asian Transition Zone, published open access with Brill in 2020. A very, very interesting, I would think, well, a very, very interesting volume of collected article, uh, articles with a very interesting introduction or introductory section um, consisting of two articles. And But, well, it's open access, so everybody is welcome to download um, the volume and learn more about um, why these kind of um, transition period, the periods, and uh, the uh, well, the the link to uh, migration studies, which is actually a very interesting one. And this volume are also two articles on migration and slavery um, regimes. Very interesting articles. Um, uh, but now today, uh, he would like to talk about local servants of the realm of swarms or locusts mobilization of military and civil labor for the empires of Western Afro-Eurasia, again in the aftermath of the first plague pandemic, 8th um, until 9th century. So this is not the first pandemic. Uh, so it's one, I think it's only the end, not the end, which just um, the preliminary end in a very, very long history of pandemics. And we are really curious to learn more about this specific pandemic you are going to describe. Thank you again for coming and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. So uh, it's a great honor to, to give this lecture and uh, it's also an opportunity to present some of my ongoing research, which is also embedded in a bigger research network, which also includes colleagues coming from not only history, uh, also history of other regions of afro Asia, but also paleogenetics, uh, paleoenvironmental studies. And as we will see, this is very much necessary in order to, to uh, deal with this phenomena. Uh, I will try to give a short introduction about the first plague pandemic uh, and what we know about it now. And then I will focus on the end of the first pandemic or more or less the abatement of, of the first plague pandemic and how this was accompanied by new signs of demographic and economic recovery both in the Byzantine Empire in the second half of the 8th century and also in the neighboring caliphate, especially after the Abbasid Revolution. So these are the phenomena I will focus on. The fourth part, uh, which is more or less already a different story to a certain extent, we will see to what extent I am able to cover this. Uh, as you will see, this will also then lead to a different, a new disease ecology and other pathogens we could talk about. But I will first start with the first plague pandemic. And of course, it's embedded in a much longer history of epidemics and pandemics in Western Afro-Eurasia, about which we know much more uh, in the last decade, especially due to paleogenetic findings. Uh, as has become clear that, for instance, the pathogen of the bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis, was already around in Western Eurasia some five, six thousand years ago. So we already have early variants in the late Neolithic and old, early, early Bronze Age. Uh, context in this area, but we will focus today on what has been called the first re real pandemic, where we have uh, a lot of evidence for a wide circulation with a really uh, severe demographic impact across wider areas of uh, Western Afro-Eurasia between the mid-6th and the mid-8th century CE. So this is the focus of today. Uh, the first outbreak of this first pandemic is usually called the Justinianic Plague, named after the emperor ruling at the time of the outbreak, which was in the year 541-42. Uh, the disease first shows up 
at least according to the sources which we have, in the Mediterranean, in the city of Pelusion, near modern-day uh, Suez in Egypt. One idea is that it came there, may maybe via the Red Sea, but this is also not entirely clear. And from then, uh, the pathogen uh, spread across the entire Mediterranean, not only in the Eastern Roman Empire, but also to the post-Roman West, but also to the Mid Middle East, to the then uh, Sasanian Empire. And the disease became endemic. Uh, so according to the standard overview by Denis Tathakopoulos, we have 18 waves of uh, plague outbreaks until the mid 8th century, although the definition of these waves has become uh, an object of discussion in the last years. But at least we know until the mid 8th century, the disease was, was again and again hitting a population in these regions. Uh, after long debate, what has become clear due to paleogenetic evidence is the pathogen. So there were first findings in graveyards in modern day Bavaria, and then more recently also in other places across Western Europe. And this is the decisive study from 2019. And the terms everyone has now become, I think, accustomed to. So PCR positive and false positive. So these are, I think, terms we have, we know now after our pandemic, so to say. And uh, these various uh, in, paleogenetic markers were now then integrated into a reconstruction of really a family of variants of Yersinia pestis, so of the bacterium of the bubonic plague, which will find also its place within the phylogenetic tree, so the family tree of this pathogen, which now reaches back to the Neolithic and, of course, is active until today, with variants still circulating in modern-day plague areas. Uh, there are also now recent findings of such paleogenetic evidence from instance from Lebanon and also from, from the northwest, uh, from the Black Sea region of the Russian Federation. But these are these will be published soon and they also augment our picture of, of the paleogen of the genetic diversity of these pathogen. Um, modern day relatives, so to say, can be found of the pathogen variants of the 6th century in one of the hotspots of modern-day Yersinia pestis, which, which is the Qinghai Tibet Plateau in modern-day People's Republic of China, which also led to the hypothesis that maybe the pathogen also of the 6th century emerged from Central Asia, then traveled to the Indian Ocean, and then made it via the trade routes via the Red Sea to Egypt and then the Mediterranean. But this is highly hypothetic. Although you find this as more or less secure scenario in recent publications, for instance, the book of Karl Harper, this is very much unclear. And this is also, uh, also part of, of ongoing research I'm, I'm, I'm in, involved in. But this is one of one of the hypotheses which, which, have, which have been uh, created. What we, however, know now for sure is that it was this disease, that it was the bubonic plague and the pathogen was Vaccinia pestis. And so we can also introduce modern day knowledge about the dynamics, dynamics of this pathogen in what we can maybe reconstruct uh, as background for the outbreak in the sixth century. And the one decisive aspect are climatic changes. So we know from modern day studies that especially very quick climatic fluctuations between more arid and more humid years in the areas where the pathogen normally circulates among the rodent population, for instance, in Central Asia. And this is such a study which also shows this uh, correlation for the 19th and 20th century, uh, that such quick climatic fluctuations can also initiate an, a spillover of this pathogen from rodent population to uh, populations of domesticated animals, and then also via the fleas, the main carriers of the pathogen, also to human populations. And maybe this also happened in the 6th century. We know that in 536, um, we have a big uh, climatic uh, downturn, a, a, a significant cooling, which has been now connected to major volcanic eruptions, then followed by a period of climatic turbulences, which has been called now the late antique Little Ice Age. And even by contemporaries, this is a, a citation from Procopius, who was a contemporary author, uh, this 536 event was somehow uh, interpreted as the starting point of the processes, also then bringing about the plague, for instance. So this would somehow fit both the contemporary observations, but also modern day knowledge about the uh, correlation between climatic changes and these plague outbreaks.
And the same is true for later outbreaks. So also the later outbreaks of the 6th, 7th, 8th centuries uh, very often overlap with periods of climatic fluctuations, which can be reconstructed also for the Eastern Mediterranean based on an increasing number of natural scientific data, as you can see on this graph. And again, these overlaps with contemporary observations. So we have uh, the text of Gurgis Bar Gabriel, who was the director of the famous Nestorian uh, medical school in Gondeshapur, who then in the late last years of, of his life also served at the new caliphal court at Baghdad. And his uh, texts were transmitted uh, in later texts by Arasi, for instance. And there we also have passages. Uh, and Gurgis Bar Gabriel was an eyewitness of the last outbreaks of this first plague pandemic in the mid 8th century. And there we have various observations uh, that uh, turbulent weather phenomena, climatic fluctuations, we would say today, uh, sometimes uh, can be observed ahead of outbreaks of plague. So we also have contemporary observations, which would, some, would somehow fit to also what we know from modern day data. What is a big debate are the actual demographic effects, especially of the first outbreak of the Justinianic plague. I've already mentioned the book of Karl Harper, The Fate of Rome, which in 2020 was also uh, translated into German, Fatum. And there Karl Harper, following earlier research, very much uh, argu argued for a very severe demographic impact that up to uh, one third or even one half of the population, for instance, of the Eastern Roman Empire died in this first outbreak of the mid-6th century. This has been challenged, especially by a younger group of colleagues around Lee Mordecai and Mel Eisenberg in a series of papers from 2019 onwards with uh, provocative titles like the Justinianic Plague, an inconsequential pandemic who tried to show on the basis of various quantitative measures that actually the demographic impact maybe was not that severe. This is an ongoing debate and maybe also hard to solve to a certain extent. So um, one, one aspect of it is how similar the 6th century outbreak and the later first plague pandemic was to the Black Death of the mid-14th century and the second plague pandemic, for which we have much better uh, also quantitative data, where, for instance, we really know that more than one third of the population in England died. And also for other regions, we have death ratios up to one half or one, even two thirds of the population. But that is... Again, ongoing debate uh, if the first plague pandemic is was really similar to the second plague pandemic. Although I would say there is there is a, a bigger part of a consensus about the larger part of the colleagues working on it that that it actually had severe demographic effects. Uh, I, however, will not so much focus on the actual demographic effects of the first plague pandemic, but how the abatement of of the disease, so the end of the pandemic may be allowed for new demographic and economic dynamics, both in the Byzantine Empire and in the Abbasid Caliphate. So we have the last outbreaks, uh, both in the provinces of the Caliphate and in the Byzantine provinces in the 740s, as you can see on this map. And what we also have is an interesting climatic parallel. So what we see across the 8th century is more or less a slow transition from this late antique legal ice age towards the more stable medieval climate anomaly. So this would also fit to a certain extent, although the 8th century and also the early 9th century were still very turbulent in climatic terms. But I will, this is, one could, one could say, maybe a question also interesting then uh, in order to, to, to come to conclusions about the actual and the demographic impact, what happened during the first pandemic, to see what then was possible in demographic in, in, in demographic and economic terms when the pandemic ended. Uh, we, all, However, I also have to be aware that a lot of the sources I will present are not just data or objective descriptions. Of course, this is clear for every historian, uh, especially the Byzantine sources are very, very opposed actually to the rulers at that time, since uh, Leo III and Constantine the Fifth, who will be the main hero of our, of our narrative, were also the initiators of the so-called iconoclasm, so the policy and, and against the whole, holy icons, and were then in retrospective uh, then uh, called heretics. And therefore, the later uh, sources which we have from the late 8th and early 9th century are very much opposed to their politics. And the same is true for a, a source I will very much use for the, say, the Arab side or the caliphal side, which is actually also a Christian chronicle, the Zuckling chronicle from 775. So also very 
contemporaneous near to the events, which of to a certain extent is also very very opposed and 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 in, in a mickle to the to the Abbasid caliphs. So starts to start with the Byzant Byzantine case, we have the description of the last outbreak of the plague, for instance, in the so-called chronographia attributed to Theophanes from the early uh, 9th century. And there we learn that this late, last outbreak uh, took place in 747, 748. Uh, it is also clearly identified, Limici nosos to Bubonos, so that it is the bubonic plague, and that it originated in Sicily and Calabria, and then made its way a, a, uh, over a then very important uh, supply route uh, from southern Italy uh, via Greece, Monemvasia is, is, is mentioned, to Constantinople when it then hit late in 747. And then for several months, uh, the pandemic was, was affecting the population, obviously with very severe demographic uh, impact, at least according to the sources. Uh, what we also learn from another uh, near contemporaneous sources from the late 8th century by the later Patriarch of Constantinople Nikephoros is that the Emperor Constantine V and obviously other parts of the population uh, preferred to leave the city. Uh, the Emperor himself uh, then uh, selected as his residence during the outbreak uh, Nicomedia in Bithynia and there he waited until he got the news that that uh, the death rates were declining and obviously the disease came to an end. And we already find towards the end of this paragraph also the description that when then the disease had ended, the emperor tried to populate it again by transferring to the multitude of people from lands and islands across the empire of the Romae, the, in Greek, the Romans, the self-description of what we now call the Byzantines. Uh, but before we come to these uh, repopulation politics, uh, some further observations. Uh, we have to reckon not only with the demographic impact of the plague, but also with other aspects which po most po possibly had reduced the population of Constantinople ahead of this last outbreak. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in ahead of the the big uh, Arab siege of Constantinople in 717, 718, we learn that, for instance, uh, the emperor ordered parts of the population who were not able to supply themselves at least for three years to leave the city. So we, we learn about that some people had to leave Constantinople. And even uh, only a few years before we have this last outbreak, we have a, a long siege of Constantinople during a civil war between Constantine V and an usurper, Atavastos. And we also learn in, in the sources that during the siege, people were trying to get out of the city because of famine and and and, and the, the dire situation. So also the population must already have been reduced before the plague hit the city. So it is not only the demographic effect of the plague. <clears throat> what we learn then is that Constantine V tried to repopulate Constantinople and also its European hinterland uh, via various means. One was uh, to bring in uh, a group of prisoners of war, but also deportees and refugees from across the Arab border. So Constantine V was able to use the civil war between the Umayyad and the Abbasids for various raids across the border towards Armenia and Syria, <clears throat> the cities of Theodosiopolis, modern day Erzurum, and Melitene. And from their population was resettled uh, to the European hinterland of Constantinople. This is one aspect. And then we also learned that he resettled uh, Roman, Roman inhabitants of uh, the islands of the Aegean, Hellas, which is central Greece, and the southern parts of the Aegean, so also Western Asia Minor. Uh, and he made them to dwell in the city so as to increase the population. So these were various avenues of how to increase the demographic impact both of the city and its hinterland. Uh, we also have, interestingly, a parallel observation of this population movement from a near contemporaneous Armenian source, the history of Revon from the late 8th century, who is describing that not only this was forced resettlement of prisoners of war, but actually also population coming from the uh, uh, Armenian provinces of the Caliphate, preferring to migrate to the Christian Empire, as it is called, although we have also a more critical uh, observation in, in in on the occasion of of, of an uprising in seven seven four seven seven five, but otherwise this is a description of one could say uh, a, a refugee migration movement 
by own will, not forced by the emperor. So this is an, an Arab perspective. With regard to the Roman population, uh, it's and we, this is not the first time that we have, have such resettlements. What we rarely get are more details, how this was organized or how the population reacted. We have one rare uh, description, very near to the events from the early 9th century, when Emperor Nikephoros I also resettled population from across Asia Minor to the European provinces. So a little bit similar to what Constantine V did. And here we hear that this action was not less grievous than captivity, so that it was compared really to uh, the situation of prisoners of war, that the people had to sell their uh, immobile properties, and it, this was uh, connected to economic loss and also the loss of their homeland. And uh, that actually, the, this this was also very, very much regarded a, 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 a very unfortunate situation by those forced to resettle. And we also get to get an observation that this resettlement, which also involved thousands of families, was organized between the months of September and completed by Holy Easter. So within a few months, which also maybe indicate the logistics or the logistical, logistical potential the empire had at this time to organize such measures. Uh, we then have later information, some 20 years after the plague outbreak, about maybe the actual effects. So that actually that this was successful from a demographic point of view, although the context is a little bit complex. Uh, we, we have from the 8th century reconstructions on, of precipitation situations in Asia Minor, for instance, which indicate that this was a rather dry uh, century or had very dry periods. And we also learned that in 777, uh, 660, uh, there was a severe drought in and around Constantinople, and this motivated Emperor Constantine V to reconstruct the aqueduct system, which had been uh, destroyed during the siege of by the Avars in 626. And uh, so one could say oh, this was because of the drought, but actually we also have earlier uh, dry periods which did not initiate such a reconstruction. So this may also indicate that we have an increased demand for water so that this very uh, sophisticated system was actually only repaired 150 years. For 150 years, there was no need to repair the system. And in order to do this, and this is also interesting, we learn about the mobilization of expert workforce, in total almost 7,000 uh, men, mostly, uh, from across the empire. So from Western Asia Minor, from the Black Sea region, from Greece, and also from the European hinterland, and especially also experts, plasterers, masons, uh, which were then used to reconstruct this aqueduct system, which, which actually extended over more than 120 kilometers to the European hinterland of Constantinople. So again, the mobilization of workforce, but maybe also the indication actually of a growing population, which needed again an operating aqueduct system. Uh, one year later, we also learn about another aspect of bringing in population. So the Constantine V uh, ransomed uh, captives of war, which had been taken by the Sclavinia. So these were Slavic speaking tribes, which then were re still very much independently uh, controlling parts of the Aegean coastline, and they had plundered the cities in the northern Aegean, in Brostenedos and Samothraki. And from there, more than 2,500 people were ransomed by the emperor uh, with silken vestments and then brought back to, to uh, the empire. And we read, we read here, and after giving them some small rewards, he let each man go wherever he wished. That's an interesting observation because actually Constantine V could have used these uh, people also as workforce according to uh, the law at that time. So we find in the Ecloga, which is a selection of earlier Roman law issued by Constantine V and his father uh, Leon III in 741, for instance, uh, repeating earlier regulations of the Justinianic legislation that uh, if someone is ransomed but cannot repay the sum of money, then he has to uh, work as a hired laborer for his ransomer until he has paid back what was agreed. So this was also a combination of ransom and forms of dependent labor, which were also regulated in Roman law. Uh, when we turn to slavery, uh, we have a very small body of evidence for slave trade in this period, as you see also in this recent statistical overview by Lenski. 
Uh, we have one description again with regard to the measures of Emperor Nicephorus I from the early 9th century, where we learned that there was obviously slave trade ongoing in the Aegean, uh, and that people bought household slaves, as far as we can uh, translate this Greek term, uh, and trying to circumvent when the circumstation of Abydos, where usually you had to pay a 10% tax of every slave uh, bought. And people circumvented it and bought uh, slaves directly in the Dorikanese islands. And this was forbidden by Nikephoros I. So there obviously was ongoing some, some, some slave trade in the Aegean. Uh, we also learn about slavery in the already mentioned Ekloga, repeating earlier regulations from the Justinianic uh, law, but also expanding, for instance, uh, the measures of, 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 of setting slaves free by various, especially Christian rituals. But otherwise, uh, what we learn about slavery at that time indicates that we have to reckon with a relatively small number. So we also learn about the use of slavery in agriculture in the so-called farmer's law, which most probably was also issued around that time, the Nomos Georgicos. But there, the, 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 the regulations we, we have about slaves, it's always in the singular, more or less, and it's connected to animal husbandry. So obviously a smaller number of individuals engaged in this particular aspect of agriculture, but not bigger number of slaves who would, inst for instance, cultivate uh, the fields. Of the, we don't learn anything of this kind. Uh, we have one very peculiar mention, reference to larger uh, number of slaves in the ownership of a rich landowner, which, however, is a hagiographic text and therefore was complicated to. Uh, to in interpret, but it's interesting. So in this text, there are very exact numbers on, on the heads of cattle and the yokes of oakens, or ox, oxen and the number of, 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 of estates. But then we only learned, and he had many slaves. Um, again, maybe household slaves, if we uh, uh, judge from the term. Uh, so no, 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 no concrete number. And uh, again, the character of the text may indicate that this is to a certain extent also a, a, a narrative motif and can also not be used as, as uh, uh, assuming larger parts of slaves, uh, for instance, in agricultural cultivation. However, what we learn is the constant in the fifth uh, was also then using, again, one could say one generation after the last, last outbreak of the plague, various measures to get a more firm uh, crisp of the obviously now increasing agricultural population and agricultural productivity. And this we learn again in these texts, which are very opposed to this emperor, uh, that he increased the taxes, which then led to uh, a re reduction of prices of commodities, of foodstuff in the capital. And this is not done by what also would have been possible due to Roman law, by uh, forced sales to, uh, to a fixed price set by the state. But obviously, these measures force the farmers to sell their, their, their products in order to get the money to pay the taxes. So this led to an intensified uh, commodification also of agricultural output and in turn to a reduction of prices. So that's, that's an, interesting, uh, an interesting process we see described here. And also in other texts, uh, Constantine V is called a relentless tax collector. Collector, of course, this is all included in this religious criticism. But nevertheless, also in this earlier text, we see that uh, this was considered by the senseless, and we can assume that this was the majority of the population as a sign of earth fertility and abundance of commodities. So, of course, a majority of population of Constantinople was very pleased that they had these uh, cheaper prices. We can also connect these activities to what we know from the distributions of the seals of the so-called Basilica Comercia. Uh, so these Comerciari were state officials which not only collected taxes and customs, but also were used as economic managers to, uh, one could say, mobilize population or resources for the supply of the city, of Constantinople, of the army. And uh, if you see, look at the geographic distribution of the red dots, so these are the Basilica Comercia during the period of Constantine V, these are exactly the, 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 the regions which are also mentioned with regard to the uh, mobilization of the population, with regard to the mobilization of the artisans, for instance, for repairing the aqueduct. So we have here an overlap, and this in, in, in total may allow to reconstruct these economic politics of Constantine V's uh, 
in the aftermath of the plague pandemic, which also led to a new increase of the population of Constantinople, but also to a new intensified uh, uh, grip of the state on the agricultural productivity. So this would be the Byzantine side, side of the story. If we now turn to the Arab side, uh, it's interesting that we uh, also around the same time, we have the last references to outbreak of the plague, for instance, in the Zuckin Chronicle, although this, this text is tricky because it's also more or less copying an earlier text from the 6th century. Uh, the very last outbreak we learn about is in 750, 751, located in southwestern Armenia and northern Mesopotamia and Syria. And this very much overlaps with actually the overthrow of the Umayyad Caliphs by the Abbasids. And interestingly, also later Arab historiography connected this change of the Caliphal dynasty with an end of the plague, of the plague pandemic, we would say today, so that Syria had been notorious for its plague, but when the Abbasids came to power, there were no more plagues. So that this all obviously is also connected in the observations of, of, of uh, medieval observers that this was also a change in the disease regime. Uh, we also have an interesting uh, near contemporary in its, uh, description of this change or the, the end of the plague pandemic in one episode of 763-764, when after the invasion of the southern Caucasian provinces by the steppe people of the Khazars, uh, who obviously brought a new pathogen, we have an outbreak of a horse pandemic in northern Iraq and northern Mesopotamia. And in this description of the Tsuknim plague, this epidemic is uh, uh, is is compared with the bubonic plague, so that actually it would have been bubonic plague, a form of bubonic plague, but it seemed wise to God, uh, through his mercy and abundant graces, to divert it from peoples to animals, <clears throat> which is also an interesting idea. So that actually, this would have been another outbreak, but they, God turned it towards the animals, and so we had no more plague outbreak, uh, which is an interesting idea. What we see then with regard to demographic and economic uh, dynamics in the caliphate is somehow similar to what we see in Byzantium, not even with the recovery of a capital by, but the establishment of a total new imperial center with the inauguration of Baghdad by An Mansur in 762, where of course there are also the, the liberations of the prices and the supply of the city. So very similar to what we see with regard to Constantinople. And again, this is different to what we learned about the Umayyad Caliphs, where we, for instance, read that they preferred to retire from the big uh, demographic centers towards this desert, for instance, where they established their well-known desert uh, palaces or also uh, residential complexes uh, like uh, Arusafa in northern Syria. But they lived far away from the people in the desert because of the fear of the plague. And now the Abbasids, when the plague is over, they establish a big, uh, unprecedented imperial demographic center. And we also see this uh, in earlier and newer archaeological evidence. For instance, the survey in the hinterland of Baghdad, in the Yala Plains, where we have an increase of settlements. And then also, as we can learn from the sources, in taxation. Also, the newer survey in the Erbil Plain in northern Mesopotamia, where we also have a second peak in the number of settlements after the Assyrian period in the earlier Abbasid period. And again, this overlaps with observations in the historiography in the Zuckling Chronicle, which in, uh, describes exactly around the same time where we have these measures in the Byzantine Empire, 20 years after the last outbreaks in the mid 760s, that we have now a new demographic and agricultural growth in North Mesopotamia, increased competition for land. So we, we, we read about an, uh, about an increasing number of lawsuits but also, of course, the attempt of the regime to intensify taxation on this basis. And this then also uh, then led to the building of an additional residence for the crown prince of Caliph al-Mansur, al-Mahdi, in Arafika. Uh, so next to Araka, where we also have still the remains of the walls of this new city. And again, this, this sounds similar to what we hear around in the same. It's the same year, actually, when the aqueduct is repaired in Constantinople. Here also, workers were mobilized across the region to build this city. And also, it's very similar to the Byzantine case we hear now of a new tax census and int intensification of taxation. And what we also hear is the role of new elements of the retinue, the Abbasids brought from the east, especially people 
which are with uh, which are indicate a Eastern Iranian or Iranian background, where we know where a large large part of the retinue of the Abbasids came. So we have this described here uh, in this uh, near contemporaneous source, and also then uh, with regard to other places uh, that this was also connected to forced resettlement. So the people were forced to return where the families originally were. Uh, listed in the tax register in order to ease taxation and that this led to a large resettlement and mobilization of population across this entire area. Again, one of these agents is called a Persian man, come, uh, indicating this new retinue of the, of the Abbasids which came from the east of the Caliphate. So this, this, this is a very interesting parallel dynamics we see in the Byzantine Empire and in the Caliphate uh, also around the emergence here of new urban of new urban centers and uh, what is also interesting is that in these sources taxation and resettlement are described as inverse than famine war and pestilence so that this is a new form of catastrophe and what is also interesting is in the Zuckling Chronicle the Zuckling Chronicle is aware that similar things were ongoing on the other side of the border in the Roman Empire in the Byzantine Empire nor was the Roman land spared from this cruel affliction, but the leaders of both our nation and theirs fell in love with money. And this, this uh, anonymous chronicler observed that similar things were ongoing with regard to the intensification of taxation. And the same we also find on the Byzantine side in the chronography of the Orphanes, where we know that it used had a big connection to Syriac material. And he uses the occasion that uh, Constantine V and Caliph al-Mansur died in the same year of 775 uh, to describe that more or less they were of the same kind and that these two wild beasts who had for a long time simultaneously devoured the human race died by God's providence. So this also indicates that, that con the contemporary sources uh, had a similar Im uh, similar uh, impression of these two rulers, which uh, in, on, uh, each of them uh, initiated new economic and demographic politics in the aftermath, or maybe in the reaction to the abatement of the first plague pandemic. So we, we see this parallel uh, on various levels, also in the interpretation of the contemporary sources. So these were the main the main aspects I wanted to 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 indicate with regard to this parallel observation. Of course, now quickly I will only add a few observations on what we can see with the increase of the use of slavery around Baghdad. Of course, this is well known to the increase of plantation economy uh, already, uh, which already started in the pre-Islamic period with regard, for instance, the cultivation of sugarcane and has been then connected to the well-known Sanj rebellion, which has been called the most successful slave rebellion of all times, uh, mainly, mainly connected to the idea that large numbers of slaves from Africa were imported to the hinterland of Baghdad. And then this eventually resulted in this rebellion starting in 869. However, this image has been very much complicated in the last years. Uh, only one could see by rereading the sources where it became clear that this was a more complex background, which not only included Sanj, but also other uh, elements of free and unfree labor coming from various regions, mobilized by the Abbasids uh, across various regions from Western Eurasia, uh, including uh, as a basis these Khurasanis from, from Eastern Iran and from Central Asia, which also mentioned then, for instance, already in, again in 766 in the Zuckling Chronicle, and we have already all these elements which we also find later. So not only the, the, the Iranian and Central Asian population, but also free and unfree labor coming from Central Asia, the Turks, the Khorasanis, uh, the Khazars. So what we also see in the later Abbasid period called here as a kind of locust. So we already have seen that the Zuckling Chronicle is very much against this new uh, retainers of the caliphs. And here it's very explicit. This is also the citation I used for the title of my paper. Uh, and of course, this is, can be then connected to other forms of import of slavery, which also is connected to the fur trade, which then is 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 uh, connected to uh, then the successor of Al Mansur Al Mahdi. And then, of course, we have the well-known increase of trade uh, of slaves coming from Eastern Europe, Sakaliba, uh, <clears throat> across the River Rhine routes, coming to. Uh, to, to also to the Caspian Sea and to Central Asia, and where we also have the increase in the amount of Arab silver flowing 
to these regions where in the ninth century, the focal point, and this is from the recent studies of Mar Marika and Koviak, is still Baghdad and the Abbasid center. And then uh, we can also date this increase of, the, of, of this coinage to the 780s. So we're also in the sources, we have this reference to this increase of trade. So this is also overlaps with the archaeological evidence, leading then to the emergence of new power centers in Eastern and Central Europe, where we also see the emergence of various forms of infrastructure structure of slave trades, like big complexes of fortified complexes, where obviously hundreds of people were collected in order then to be moved on for the slave trade towards the caliphate. And the same we can observe with regard to Central Asia, where we have Turkish slaves, especially also Mamluks, so warrior slaves, but also eunuchs, uh, connected with the trade of Khorezm in Central Asia. We have then an increase in the early, uh, eighth, uh, early 9th century uh, with the war, war between the two successors of Harun al-Rashid, and where we also learn how these slaves were brought into the caliphate, for instance, also to pacts or uh, peace treaties like with the ruler of uh, Kabulistan in modern-day Afghanistan, who had then br to bring an annual tribute of 2,000 August Turkic slaves. Uh, we also learn about then the conflict of this new uh, retinue with the uh, established elites in Constantinople, uh, where this new retinue was settled in the uh, quarter of Harbiya to the northwest of the round city. And we also have a list of the places of origin of what was now then called the Al Harbiya, coming from the eastern periphery of the caliphate. And these conflicts are then also described and then led, as is well known, eventually to the establishment of a new capital of the Abbasids, Samara by al Mutasim in 836. Again, a massive urban uh, project uh, along the, the riverside of the Tigris. So another, one could say, indicator of, of demographic uh, growth in these already, of course, several decades after the end of the plague. Uh, we also have movement of uh, population rebellious groups of rebels from the northern caliphate towards uh, Byzantium, the Karamites. And also there we have similar observations to this. Uh, this brought about the uh, conflict with, with all the old settled uh, elites, which, for instance, criticized Emperor Theophilus, who was ruling at the time as philo-barbarian, bringing into this, the, the empire so many people of, of foreign ethnicity. Um, and interestingly, then these two uh, networks then eventually clashed in the attack of the caliphate on Byzantine Asia Minor in 838, uh, which is also one could say a peak of the of these overlapping networks, where where we see the the mobilization of free and unfree uh, military uh, workforce across the um, uh, the uh, Abbasid Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire, and the clash of these two networks in this in this war of 838, which also brought about internal conflicts in both networks. But what is interesting, this this is why I wanted to add this. Uh, what we can connect to this new mobilization, which we find in the later decades, is actually indications of a new mobility of pathogens, because via these routes uh, and the mobilization of the mer merchants, but also of, of sl the, the slaves, uh, we also have then other paleogenetic evidence, which is, for instance, connected to the city of Gneshtovo uh, near Smolensk in modern-day Russia, uh, which was in the intersection of areas of these routes, and where in the late 8th and early 9th century, we see an increasing inflow of both Byzantine and Arabic coins and other objects. Uh, so connected to both trade networks, to both empires. And uh, what recent research has brought about from Kneshtovo, from one uh, graveyard there, is one variant of a family of variants of the orthopox virus varioli, the pathogen of smallpox. So what we can see from this other study is that roughly... One century, or even less, already in the late 8th century, maybe 50 years after the end of the first plague pandemic, we have a, 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 an increased diffusion and uh, an, an emergence of new variants of smallpox, uh, which became an increasing relevant pathogen across uh, Western Afro-Eurasia. Uh, it is already mentioned also earlier in the work of Kurgis Bar Gabriel, already around 770, where it it has at least the same the same amount of 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 of, of space in his text as has plague, and is maybe even described already as more as more dangerous. Uh, 
And this would, would overlap with the new paleogenetic evidence uh, so that we maybe have a change of disease ecologies. So after the end of the first plague pandemic, uh, there was space, what one could say, for new pathogens. And this is can be observed also in later, better documented periods. You see, for instance, here the statistics for the abatement of typhus and the increase of polio in the United States. And we, we have various episodes of such, such transitions between different disease ecologies. And this could be connected to this increase of human mobility, partly to this increase of human mobility emerging from this intensification of, of demographic and economic activities, both in the Byzantine Empire, but especially in the Caliphate. And we learn already some 20 years after the foundation of Baghdad that the city again was hit by a severe epidemic, which was not the plague. We don't know what it is because the description is very short, but we have later descriptions which indicate that then smallpox had a more prominent role, and we have similar observations from the Byzantine Empire. Uh, this was not only brought about by state action, we also know about mercantile action, we have talk, mentioned the Rus, the Khaza, so we also know about the Radania merchants, which were active in the slave trade. So um, this was, is more or less an addendum to the main story around it to, to say, uh, to tell, but if we look in the decades after these first generations or after this first 30 years after the first, end of the first plague pandemic up to the uh, turn from the 7th to the 8th century, uh, from the 8th to the 9th century, the early 9th century, with this increase of the mobility of people also towards these new or re emergent imperial centers, which uh, increased in population after the end of the first plague pandemic, we found we find maybe the infrastructure for another. Uh, epidemic diffusion for a new disease ecology which can be connected for instance to smallpox so this is more or less uh the, the story i wanted to present or some of the, the hypotheses one could connect to the material to, that we have so that the abatement of the first plague, plague pandemic was followed by parallel politics in the Byzantine and the arab empires which supported the re-emergence of imperial urban centers including an intensified access to the rural hinterlands and their workforce and the mobilization of workforce both free and unfree or various form of dependence that these imperial capitals equally became centers of attraction of new flows of unfree and free civil and military workforce supported by state and mercantile actions and that these new circuits of movements of people and commodities in turn may have contributed to the emergence of a modified disease ecology after the first plague pandemic which then uh, became relevant for the following centuries uh, with this uh, i thank you very much for your attention and i'm looking forward to the discussion Thank you.